that is science and sikhi on the origins of the universe big bang was there the only subtle difference sikhi had with science was what was there before big bang according to science it was void but sikhi doesn't believe in that sikhi said no somebody was there in its unmanifested form and our good colleague at the back Kamal Tariwal sent me a link to one of the YouTube sites which Professor Lawrence, I think his name was, he was speaking at LSC about three, four weeks ago. And something unique he said, he said, there's a possibility of something from nothing. Something from nothing is possible. He said religion doesn't believe in it. Unfortunately, we could not make to that presentation that something can happen for nothing, from nothing and religion doesn't believe in it. It actually bothered me for a few days. Then how can we, is this not stated in Guru Granth Sahib? The Big Bang is stated, everything else is stated, what was there before? Suddenly it dawned one day that yes, a Juni Sabbath. We think of that very carefully. A Juni Sabbath created himself from himself. Something from nothing. He created himself, the almighty creator. So I will not dwell too much on that. That program is going to be rolled out to Nishan, which is the uh, uh, amalgamation of the Sikh societies of University of London and other universities. <coughs> And hopefully other professionals will also join that. See, city Sikhs will also join that at some stage. Uh, and we have appealed to them to join so that all the youth can understand that Sikhi, if not ahead of science, at least it has got parallel thinking with, with that. And now look how appropriate this program is. He's created the world, the universe. What was the state of that world just before the arrival of God's messenger, Guru Nanak Dev Ji. What was that state of affairs of the world? I will just very quickly do some very quick housekeeping. Uh, this program is being recorded, both internally, and uh, we are very lucky uh, that I think one of the channels is here, the Sikh channel is here. If any of you don't feel comfortable with the recording, I would advise that you can actually sit away from the cameras so that the camera doesn't focus on you. We don't want you to leave. We need you here. Your support is critical. Uh, also, please switch off your telephones or put them on silence. Before I hand you over to the director of this program, Gurtian Singh Gatora, I would like to call upon um, our mentor, Mahinder Singh Mant, who is single-handed actually carried out the tasks here for a number of years, uh, to say a few words. I will now call upon Mahinder Singh Mant. Ladies and gentlemen, Vaheguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Vaheguru Ji Fateh, I won't take long. I just want to say welcome to Gurpreet. Gurpreet is a very, very common name. While I was in the fifth, there were five Mahinders there. So Gurpreet, Harpreet, uh, I don't want to go, uh, I've done a lot of research how people keep names and surnames some of the time. But Gurpreet is a very common name and Harpreet for the girls. Uh, welcome. I knew him simply as a presenter on Eknur. I wanted to see him. God is great. He is here. Now, second thing is, I was surprised when I opened today, internet, he's all over the page. He's an actor as well. And the acting is especially his role as Banda Singh Bahadur. And many more are planned. We are very pleased. We are very thankful. And we'll see you again and again. And thank you very much for coming. Another thanks goes to Sikh Channel. They're recording this program. We are very grateful to them. And they are doing it for free. So, but nothing, you know, money makes the mayor go. 
without money nothing works whether it's direct hand or back hand or whatever it is so i request all of you whatever you can afford please help uh, six channel the way you can uh, i don't want to take more of your time thank you gurpreet and thank you uh, six channel please uh, and all of you and help six channel the way you can thank you very much thank you man saab ji it is actually as uh, man saab ji said it's of a rare pri privilege and honor that mr gurpreet singh ji who is well recognized not just in the uk in europe in america in the far east australia singapore malaysia his programs are viewed with a lot of um uh dedication and one of the discussions uh, over the last two days with him has been the youth we want to focus on the youth and that's exactly what this program is today that our future is in the hands of the youth uh, without much ado i will now hand you over to uh, the director of the program gurtian singh gatora who will take um, uh, the mic from now thank you thank you waguru ji ka khalsa waguru ji ki fateh um uh, karmjit paaji gave me the the task of uh, um uh, getting this uh, um uh, presentation um ready it it's it's quite a difficult and quite an involved process because you know the history of the world is wide uh where do you start you know uh, humankind has been on earth for 40000 years uh what elements do you pick on and we thought long and hard about this and uh, when we sort of really sort of drill down it was what were the events that really shaped guru's thinkings what happened not just in india but what happened more sort of widely uh, around the world because those atrocities that sort of happen in, uh, in uh, you know in 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 europe in uh, northern india certainly shaped the thinking of our gurus so hopefully this presentation will pretty much end where the real journey begins and that real journey is by the arrival of guru nanak dev ji the 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 uh, the reformer um, who really s pretty much tried to solve all the issues that the world was facing i mean you know we're we're still almost back back to where we were unfortunately because we just can't learn the message um so you know we we looked at the areas and the three main areas where we thought we'd look at we'd just look at some religion uh to, to start off with um and then we would look at uh, the uh, other sort of the conflicts the the power struggle that happened sort of in Europe and also in uh, um in in India and then thirdly we would thought we'd concentrate on the bhakti movement it has a lot of similarities with with sikhi but there are key differentials as well you know it doesn't quite go all the way um uh, and those um, similarities and differences will be um shared uh, with you by by the presenters i mean guru gobind singh said you know manas ki jaat ek pehchaniya for example um and you may have seen the uh, uh, the recent uh, program on uh, um the bbc by andrew ma the history of the world where you know he looks at the 40000 year history and pretty much goes back and says actually you know we all came from the same tribe in africa that traveled through africa into europe and then into sort of asia australia and america i mean if you just sort of think about what guru gobind singh ji said and you and you look at the actual history that science is now proving how can these conflicts occur you know they have in, they have they've certainly occurred in the past can we find something within those messages to make things uh, better for the future and uh, hopefully sikhi will will do that um now just well i won't take too too much more of your time but uh, i want to get these uh, youngsters i mean these youngsters uh, shubjeevan kaur gotra she is my uh, my daughter um uh, got uh, uh, karanvi singh tello and uh, just raj singh uh, um uh, uh, hoti now these guys you know at the end of the day we can stand up here and talk but it's the youngsters that we really need to inspire because it's the youngsters that can go out there and and really connect with the younger youth once they start doing that we can hopefully begin to take the 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 message of sikhi to the wider world 
Um, and that's all I, I want to really say. I, I think we should just get into the uh, presentation. So start off with on the, the religious aspects, uh, um, Shubjeevan Gaur Gautra is going to... Um, uh, um, so the following presentation focuses on the times prior to Guru Nanak Dev Ji's birth. And whilst doing our research, um, we realised some key themes that kept propping up. And they were empires, tribalism and the co um, conquest of land and all these were very significant and constantly occurring throughout history so we thought we should pick up on these um, subjects um, we asked ourselves um, when did the words religion and empire become synonymous uh, establishing and expanding an empire is for economic and social gain religion is what I think most people believe is a self-proclamation of humility and humbleness to a supreme source or being. Now, to me, these two concepts seem worlds apart. And in fact, they once were. When conquering an alien region, religion had absolutely no place. This was just for social and economic gain. And um, the separation was very clear. However, this clear separation became fuzzy. And religion became a key tool in expansion um, of empires. And now is, it was used as a manipulation tool um, of the natives using scaremongering tactics. Because um, as they would never dare question their faith, so why would they dare question the leaders? Um, religion is the fear of the unknown. Who is God? Where is God? Why are we here? And um, with this, I think the rulers abused religion thus destroying the spiritual message. So, move on. Uh, so, uh, I'll now be uh, moving on to a brief introduction of a few major religions um, or of that time to provide a backdrop as to what Guru Nanak Dev Ji was coming into. So, let's take a look at Buddhism. Siddhartha Gautama, and what we more commonly know him as Buddha, uh, was born in the current day Nepal around 563 BC and it's just highlighted there on the map where exactly he was born. He was born into excessive wealth. Uh, Siddhartha took the steps of leaving all the riches behind um, and beginning a journey and path onto enlightenment. Um, during this time, uh, he discovered and established some basic beliefs of Buddhism, and we'll just have a look at them. So, um, the one main belief is that there is no personal God. We are here on this earth as a humanity, and um, this is one belief, I think, that contradicts most other faiths. Uh, we all, he also... Um, taught about the path to enlightenment is through practice and development of morality, humanity and wisdom, not really your connection and devotion to God because there is no God within Buddhism. He completely discredited the caste system and <clears throat> he did not stress the importance of work. And I think that's the ma main difference between Sikhism and, sorry, Sikhi and Buddhism is that we are very much involved in our community and work is very central to us whereas it wasn't to buddha and he you know he was more on the devotional side and so on i think um if you have a quick look at all these beliefs um all of them are in direct conflict um with uh, brahmin uh, ideology and completely uh, completely inconsistent so that would bring up a lot of um sort of uprising a lot of um, tension between the two uh, clans buddhism and um Brahmins. Um, a figure that was hugely influential with regards to uh, Buddhism was Ashoka the Great and uh, we'll take a look at him now and what he did throughout India and to push Buddhism across um, Central Asia. So Emperor Ashoka was of the uh, Monya uh, dynasty and is hailed as one of the greatest emperors of all time. Sorry. Um, being from Bihar uh, there was a bubbling family feud, and this was with a neighbouring district, um, Kalinga. 
And um, due to this bubbling family feud, he decided that he would conquer Kalinga. And he did, very successfully. However, after the conquest, he stepped out onto the battlefield and he saw the atrocities, he saw the massacre, he saw the butchery of, of innocent civilians. And he revoked and he changed his ways. And he embraced Buddhism. And whilst doing so, he embraced truth, tolerance, and he was a vegetarian. Um, I think it's really interesting to note that um, he was the first emperor in human history to ban slavery, hunting, fishing, and deforestation, and the death sentence. I mean, America only banned slavery 200 years ago. This was 2,000 years ago, and this was an emperor. So um, I think that's really important. And because of such his... his um, his vast, um, vast empire, he was able to push Buddhism throughout, throughout Asia. And I think that map shows it very nicely how extensive Buddhism was throughout the whole of Asia and it was prevalent within India. Um, however, there was the downfall um, and rapid decline of Buddhism. And this is when a descendant of Ashoka was murdered and replaced by someone of Brahmin origin. And this didn't just occur in Ashoka's dynasty and his, uh, you know, and across here. It occurred currently throughout India. So there was this infiltration of the Brahmins into Buddhism because, as I stated before, the constant conflicts between the two. And um, this map nicely, oh, sorry, this map nicely shows on the right here the infiltration and the breaking up of India into tribes, which allowed for the infiltration of Brahminism, uh, Brahm Brahmism and and ousting out Buddhism into sort of neighbouring countries where it is pretty prevalent, uh, prevalent today. Um, now I'm going to fast forward 200 years and we're going to have a brief history of Islam because it was um, very relevant to uh, India. So um, we'll be covering some key topics that occurred um, with Islam. And um, firstly, we're going to look at Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. So he came from the Qureshi tribe and they were very influence, uh, influential in uh, Mecca. And um, at that time, actually, they were in charge of the Kaaba, which is what we know as a Muslim holy shrine. Uh, Muhammad's time, um, Muhammad's time um, while he was um, on this earth uh, shows a rapid expansion of Islam. And if we look onto the map here, the darker maroon colour covering Saudi Arabia actually highlights how extensive during his lifetime Islam had spread from being just a tribe in Mecca, Medina. Now, if we look at the orange areas, they, they, they show 20 years after Muhammad's death, how the expansion of Islam after that. And further on, if we look at the yellow areas, that's 40 years after Muhammad's death. So as you can see, probably very, very expensive, um, expansive and um, extensive um, movement. So uh, we're going to move on to another significant um, period within Islam and this was the golden age and this refers, refers to the era of civilization <coughs> predominantly for men um, within um, Saudi and so on and um, this is where civilization with regards to scholars, astronomers, doctors, literature and so on really took off and they were much encouraged and I think this allowed um, neighboring neighboring um, uh, countries and so on to uh, gain a, a trust with Saudi Arabia due to their rapid civilization that you know they hadn't seen for well never really so um, and that occurred during the 9th to the 12th century so now we're going to have a look at the trade route so where is the connection with India and um, when did Islam reach the shores of India and that's exactly what it did it reached the shores of India and these are through the trade routes so from this map, uh, I'm sure you can see the trade routes that from, uh, from the left here going, to, going into uh, the south of India. And um, uh, the, when, when they reached the shores of India, not only did they exchange goods, they exchanged traditions and values and so on. Uh, the Muslims were very readily adopted the Indian numerical system and pushed it into Europe and across Arabia, um, often as their own work. Um, but also they uh, translated Sanskrit te texts for the massive masses to be, be able to understand and pick up, which wasn't even done in India, to be honest with you. And um, initially there was a very peaceful exchange. Whether this lasted or not, I think we'll, we'll be moving on to that later on. So we've had Islam and we've had Buz Buddhism. So we're going to move on to the Crusades because they were very um, prevalent in history. 
So the Crusades spanned from 1095 to 1272, and there were a series of nine Crusades. And the map on, sorry, the table on the right shows that nicely. That you know, over 200 years there were nine Crusades, and um, they were all in the name of the Christian faith. So they were they're highly disputed as to why they started. Um, but a key figure um, with regards to the Crusades was Pope Urban II. Um, so let's um, have a look as to why they were so disputed. So there are two lines of thought to this, and uh, we have a defensive response. And this is said to be a direct response to the fast establishing Abrahamic religion, Islam. Um, at that time, Syria, Egypt, and the rest of Northern Africa and Spain were all Christian states, very different to what we see today. And um, they were slowly being taken over by Islamic State. And the Christian and Jewish people that resided within these states were not allowed to practice their religions on, under Islamic rule. Whereas the other way around, with a Christian state, you were very accepted to practice your own faith and religion and so on under their rule. So, number one, they thought this very to be very unfair. And um, they were also worried about Christian... Christianity being ousted out of Israel, out of Syria, Egypt, and so on, as it had been, and where was where was left to go? You know, they were fast expanding, they were conquering, they were um, converting, and uh, there was executions and so on. So they feared that if no action was taken, their faith would simply not exist, and therefore the Crusades were a necessary course of action. However, there is also a destructive um, line of thought. And this is where um, they were initiated by Pope Urban II and he gave the, him, um, gave the Crusades his blessing and initiated them and they were just matching up to the might of the Muslims and they wanted to convert and it was all about exile. But once again, the arguments for both are um, both there and um, it's, it's up to an individual's choice as to what they decide. Um, they're very debatable, but one thing that can be sure and certain is that they were bloody and they were gory and they were gruesome. And um, I think that takes me on to, nicely to Gerunvir, who will go on to the next bit of the um, presentation. Vaigudji ka khalsa, Vaigudji ki fateh. Okay, so my name's Gerunvir, <coughs> and today I'm going to be talking to you about the struggle for power and how this impacted upon India and how and how it kind of went along really. So my first point is the Mongols. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a couple of empires, the Mongols and the Ottomans, before we get on to Indian history as such. So that quote up on the board, that kind of, for me, and I think generally that sums up uh, Genghis Khan and his motives. Genghis Khan was very unusual in the sense that he was able to foresee the potential of disunited Mongol tribes becoming united and the effect was huge. Through political manipu uh, manipulation and military might, Genghis Khan was able to form what became the largest contiguous land empire by 1227. So within 21 years, Genghis Khan had created what you can see on the board. It was a phenomenal achievement that was bigger than the Roman Empire of the West. So as you can imagine, this man was a phenomenal warrior and a phenomenal manipulator as well at the same time. And for that reason, this kind of victory did not come without brutality. Yes, Islam is a peaceful religion in theory. However, as I will show you over the course of my presentation, it was misused quite a lot by, by its leaders. And in this respect, Genghis Khan did. He, he, he was brutal. He went around looting, killing, and mass converting people to every city that he went to. It, re it really was quite br brutal. But moving on to the consolidation of the empire. As you can see up there, the Mongols ruled from 1206 to 1368. So the consolidation period was generally up until after Genghis Khan's death in 1227 up until 1294, where many of his successes, his sons, his grandsons, were able to essentially just kind of keep the Mongol Empire going. They increased it somewhat, a little bit, but not, mu not as much as Genghis Khan was able to. And at 1294, that's really where the Mongol Empire reached its hilt. 
it, uh, from after there onwards, the seeds of downfall that Genghis Khan had, lay, had laid through the fact that he'd given his whole empire to every member of the imperial family, be it sons and immediate family, so wife of sons, etc., things like that. That was really now coming through. As you can see on the map, and I will will demonstrate it a little bit, the empire pictured up there at tw in 1294 became split into four smaller empires. This was basically due to greed and desire and a huge amount of infighting between Genghis Khan's sons and grandsons because they all wanted a little bit of the empire. They wanted its riches and they wanted the power. So just, just keep that in mind, that's how the Mongols fell. Keep the idea of the Mongols in your mind, we will come back to that later on. Now moving on to the Ottomans. My personal view, I think they're better, much more powerful than the Mongols, but that's just me. But moving on to the history of it, as you can see up on the board there, that kind of, for me again, sums up the general Ottoman view of the world. They were violent and they would conquer ruthlessly. So bring it back to the kind of the origins of the Ottoman Empire. In that image there, that's the founder of the Ottoman Empire. The, his name was Osman I. And legend goes, goes like this. A tree grew out of Osman I's stomach. And this tree, its roots spread across three different continents. And from these, con uh, from these roots, rivers, sp um, rivers spread. And these rivers were the Nile, the Tigris, the Euphrates, and the Danube. So that's the edges of what we now know today as the Great Ottoman Empire. And from the branches, the branches spread to four different mountain ranges, the Balkans, the Atlas, the Taurus, and the Caucasus ranges. So what we're trying to create there is, or what the legend is trying to create, is the fact that this empire will be created, because this, this legend was only really formed around the 1800s. So I don't think it's entirely true that a man was able to grow a tree out of his stomach, but yeah. Um, so moving on to my next point. So from 1300 through till the mid 15th century, a huge amount of force, violence and expansion was needed from the Ottomans. And it resulted in the fall of Constantinople in 1453, which we now t know today as modern Istanbul. So this was the Ottomans' greatest achievement. It established their power in Eastern Europe, and in, Eastern and in the Eastern Mediterranean. It meant that their empire now stretched from Iraq in the east to France in the west, Budapest in the north in Hungary, and North Africa in the south. So they had a vast, vast empire. Not as big as the Mongols, but vast nonetheless. It was huge. And really, the consolidation continued under the man on the right there, Suleiman the Magnificent, um, forming trade treaties and military alliances with countries in the West, England, France, the countries that we know today. But more importantly, and I think more relevant to today's presentation, is the way the Ottomans fell. It was quite a slow fall over a period of about 100 years, and it was painful. It sprung out of something called the Tanzimat period in 1839 through to 1876, where a huge amount of power was divulged to the, uh, to the people within the Ottoman Empire. So they gave a huge amount of freedoms to national minorities, ethnic minorities, and religious minorities. They even went as far as decriminal decriminalizing homosexuality, which uh, for the mid-19th century was pretty pretty uh, forward, to be honest. So giving these powers to, to the people of the Ottoman Empire, it allowed them to be f uh, have free freedom of thought, have freedom of speech. And it was this ideal, this philosophy, this freedom of religion that allowed the people to spring up and cause the ultimate downfall of the Ottomans in 1922. And I just want you to keep that thought in your mind for future presentations, because that, for me, and I think many of us within the presentation group that we re researched, that's what we found Guru Nanak Devji did. He used people power, he used people's philosophies and ideas to rise up 
and destroy the established order. So before I move on to this slide, I kind of just want to give you a little bit of background because you're all probably wondering why I just spoke for about three, four minutes about two Muslim empires kind of non-related to India. Well, the point is, is that they had spread to France, they had spread to Iraq, they had spread to the Middle East. Islam had spread and it had spread violently. Though peaceful in theory, it was spreading and it was spreading ruthlessly. The only natural gateway to India was the Punjab and India was the next logical step. All you have to do is look at the map. The Middle East up there, North Africa's there. India's yet to be conquered and it's full of riches. If you want to expand your empire, go to India. And ex that's exactly what they did. So let's just take it back a little bit to the 7th century. Kind of throwing you around in history, I know, but stay with me. So we've just been to the 1300s. Now let's take a back, a back step 600 years to the 7th century. So within the 7th century, somewhat 70 years after Muhammad's death, Muslims were, were pretty peaceful. As Jeevan previously said, they, uh, they reached the shores of India in the 7th century via sea trade routes. So that's the south and western, in and western India. Traded their wares very peacefully. Built the first mosque in Kerala as well. All very peaceful. No mass conversions, no violence, no looting. But then we hit the 8th century. And the 8th century is when Islam exploded. They've got the foot in the door, and then they went for it. Through violence, through conversions, through killing. They established the first town in, uh, first town in modern day Pakistan called Sindh. And it actually went on till the early 10th century when this man here, Mahmud of Ghazni, established Punjab as his state and established his rule over Punjab. As this continued, Islam gradually grew more and more powerful and the Delhi Sultanate became under their control. So that's Punjab and generally the whole of North India. Muslims controlled the whole of North India. So you can see how the rapid expansion in just about 200 years, Islam has taken most of the Eastern world, a lot of the continent of, continent of Europe, and now they're coming to India. So now we move on to what most of you, well, if you've done a little bit of reading, will know that Emperor Timur's invasion of India in 1389. But let me give you a little bit of a backdrop before that. So the story about 30, 40 years before is that, if we go back to this picture here, the Delhi Sultanate, the picture over here, there was a ruler called Firuz Shah Tughlaq. He was Muslim, but he was very, very weak. And he had kind of allowed the independent rulers of the states to rule as they wished. You know, there's a quote from a contemporary Islamic writer saying, the emirs and maliks had become kings and spent their income as they liked. So they were just doing whatever they want with their own vested interests. And because of this, you know, there was anarchy, Punjab, and the Dili Sultanate was an easy prey to, inv uh, to invasion. And the man that managed to invade, as with anything, if there's domestic tr trouble throughout history, if you've studied any part of history, if there's domestic trouble, there will be foreign invasion. And there was foreign invasion in a big way from Emperor Dimmer. He was brutal. That quote up there, one hour, 10,000 Hindus dead. I can tell you in one day, 100,000 Hindus were also killed. This man was he, he was beyond anything I've seen and studied across the whole of history. This operation that Dimmer committed was also likened to the 1941 invasion of Russia by the Nazis, which was similarly br brutal. Though it killed more, it, Dimmer's invasion was positively, positively brutal. Let me tell you a little bit about how he invaded. Dimmud was a man of uh, Mongol origin, hence why I told you a little bit about the Mongols. You remember that the Mongols never actually got to India, they never invaded India. So Dimmud, being the grandson of Genghis Khan, believed India is the next logic step. And how do you do it? Through the natural gateway, 
which is of course Punjab. So, tearing through Punjab, which we now know as modern day Pakistan, Afghanistan and of course India. Killing people, looting, converting people as we go, city by city, Dimur invaded Punjab and took the whole of the Delhi Sultanate as well. Set up a political framework that at the beginning worked a little bit, but as time wore on, 10, 20, 30 years later, there was a lack of centralised political gravity. That means that Punjab as a whole really had no firm ruler. And because of this, there was anarchy. It was an easy prey to invasion, lack of economic stability, and no cultural orientation. No one really knew where they came from, in other words. Similar also to the situation today, I, I, I would say. But um, this gave easy prey to another dynasty, called, what we call the Lodi dynasty. They were, um, of Afghan, Af Af they were from Afghanistan, and they had a slightly different way of ruling. They ruled so much so that the noble ruling class was on a par with the ruler. So, I mean, if you can imagine this, this is kind of, it's, it's ludicrous when you actually look into it. If you think about it today, so the upper class of society would be ruling alongside the British Queen, which doesn't really make sense to most people in this rule, room, but that is the way the Luddis, the Luddis ruled. And it was, as Guru Nanak Dev Ji has said up here, it was dis disastrous. There was corruption, corruption was rife, and it just generally was not a great place to live unless you were an Afghan noble, because there was huge amounts of political corruption. So at the Battle of Banipat in 1526, when Emperor Babur defeated the Lodi dynasty, Guru Nanak Dev Ji said that quote up on the board, which I'm sure you can all read. The king dispenseth, dispenseth justice when his palm is filled. A kingdom that was a jewel was wasted by the dogs. No one will mourn their passing. So I mentioned before a little bit about Emperor Barber. All the uh, slightly senior people in the room will probably know him as quite, a, uh, quite a, an aggressive, violent, horrific ruler. So you're all probably confused as to why I've put this quote on the top of the board, essentially saying that whatever religion you are, you can live in my kingdom. Whoever you are, you can live in my kingdom. You don't have to be a Muslim. You're all probably confused as to why he's saying that. The answer is, he was terribly brutal. Abs he was worse than Emperor Thimur prior to the reformation of, Guru Nanak, uh, reformation of himself by Guru Nanak Dev Ji. The socio-political situation that I've built up over this presentation reached a height and its greatest height at Emperor Barber. Guru Nanak Dev Ji was able to reform Barber through a story which we will tell in our next presentation, rest assured. But he was able to reform him and this gave Sikhi the opportunity, a platform within the Mughal dynasty to show what it was about, to teach others to grow. And it's thanks to Guru Nanak Dev Ji and his reformation of Babur that we were able to do that. <coughs> so before I pass on to my colleague Jasraj, I'm just going to say a couple, of, a couple of things. You've witnessed how much India was invaded over two, three hundred years um, by Muslims, by several, several people. But why was this? Ask yourself that, why was this? It was because of the fabric of Indian society was so weak because of the Hindu caste system, which we'll come to later and just Raj will cover. That's what the problem was. Mm -hmm. And just keep that in your mind and just Raj will talk to you a little bit now about the Bhakti movement. Vaiguji ka khalsa, Vaiguji ki fateh. Thanks, Karami. Vaheguruji ka khalsa. Vaheguruji ki fateh. So we've had a look at the social, economic and political scene. Um, a lot of information from Karami there with dates and information. You'll be pleased to know there's not going to be a test at the end of this lecture, <laughs> so you can all relax now. Um, but I'm going to now talk about the, the Bugdi movement um, and exactly why that was relevant. And it was massively relevant. Um, essentially, you know, 
I'm sure in this room you've all maybe have differing levels of knowledge on what the movement actually was. Um, really, the movement saw sort of changes and a gradual movement away from some of these old traditions we'd seen under uh, Brahminism, um, things like caste system, rites and rituals and that sort of thing. Um, but if we um, take a look at the root meaning, Bhakti means to adore. Um, really that means sort of adoration and devotion to God. That's, that's, gen that's what it comes from. A little bit of confusion can arise um, because essentially there are two sub-movements. So you've got the South and the North. Now if you Google Bhakti, a lot of the information that comes up is on the South movement. Um, which is relevant in some ways, but the focus of this topic is actually going to be more aligned to the north, purely because from a Sikhi perspective, that's where more of the linkages come in. You know, the Bhagads whose teaching speech are in the Guru Granth Sahib Ji, those are the ones that came from the north, which is also known as, as a radical movement, as you can see in, in the bullet point there. Um, as I said, it refers to devotional worship to God or, or, or deity. Um, in the south, generally, Refer, it referred to sort of reincarnations of God, multiple gods, whereas in the, in the north we started to see this shift towards one god. So you can see quite a, a broad range of time there, 6th to the 15th century. The south movement actually came in on the 6th. The focus of this is the north, which came in in about 1100, which is why I've underlined the emphasis there and the bullet point at the bottom. And like I said, south and north, both very different. North radical movement, the South, there were various schools, groups, individuals who had an effect um, and in sort of carrying that movement through. One of these schools, one of the, um, probably the most, one, one of the most significant was certainly Vaishnavism. And essentially what that was, um, like it says there, South India Bhakti movement based um, a lot on uh, Vaishnavism. The belief that Vishnu was incarnated by taking birth in a human form from time to time, so this idea of reincarnations. Um, obviously not so much of a, a link to Sikhi there, but if you look in those bullet points at the bottom, caste and, and these sort of ritualism, ritualisms, idol worship, those came up and they still in the south, they did acknowledge that, okay, these are going on, and they began to question those sort of the caste system and whether you know, those rituals were really right, should we be doing this? <coughs> a bit reluctant, I think, to change that initially at first. Obviously, this system had been ingrained in the history for a long, long time, um, and so they didn't really want to anger too many people at the top, the Brahmins, for example, as a, I guess, fear largely of what might happen to them. Um, but now let's concentrate on, on the North movement, as I said we would, the radical movement. Um, and like I said, in sharp contrast, it says they're based upon the adoration of one God. So there was this movement to one God, as you'll see from the latest Bhagavad, who is actually unborn and therefore can't reincarnate. So um, the, the separation from Vaishnavism in the South there. Emphasis on singing the praises and for the love of the God. And crucially, that was in the, the language of the people. So everyone could understand that and not just in a, a script for which just the higher classes could understand. So obviously everyone is able to have access to that information, everyone is able to achieve that path to enlightenment and to God. The South, I, I, I mentioned that obviously they'd started to question these ideologies, caste, rituals, etc. In the North we saw more of a stronger denouncement of, this, of these ideologies. Um, interestingly, the buggers generally led a life of withdrawal from the world and no real involvement in sort of social affairs. There was this belief um, at the time that the only thing that's real is God, uh, everything else is considered what is called Maya, which is an illusion. Um, and you know, some, some of these beliefs were quite strong in that effectively life on earth is almost hell and you can only be, really achieve bliss after death. So I'll come on to the first uh, Bhagat here, Bhagat Farid, born as you can see a Sufi Muslim from the Punjab in around 1170. Um, 134 hymns incorporated into Siddhi Guru Granth Sahib Ji, so quite a large number there. Uh, and Farid was well, someone who mixed with both Hindus and with Muslims alike. Certainly not afraid to criticise Brahmins or the Qazis, as you can see up there. Um, and he also shunned attachment to worldly belongings. 
perhaps appropriate to today with us all with our various gadgets, iPods, iPhones. I know I'm certainly guilty of uh, not being to put mine, not being able to put mine away, which my mother will probably uh, back me up on. So uh, I think Fareed definitely, um, probably definitely saw saw something that in, into the future in some ways. And here's an example uh, of one of these verses in the Guru Granth Sahib Ji, which I'm going to ask Nafdeej if you could kindly read out. Dilo Mohabbat Jine Sei Sacha. They alone are true, whose love for God is deep and heartfelt. Jine Man Bor Mukh Bor Se Kande Kachya. Those who have one thing in their heart and something else in their mouth are judged to be false. Now, there's no direct mention of the Brahmins, of those, upper, of those priests and the upper classes there. If one were to make an educated guess, I think it's pretty clear that that's exactly who he was referring to, and they certainly weren't practicing what they were preaching. Um, here's a, a second quote, actually. So, um, Farid was quite humble uh, and critical of himself and fellow Sufis who went around wearing these darker clothes, synonymous with sort of upper, upper classes. But were sinful inside, nevertheless. Farida kale mande kapde, kala manda ves. Farid, my clothes are black and my outfit is black. Gunihi pareya mafira lok kahe darvish. I wander around full of sins and yet people call me a dervish, a holy man. Tati toi na palve je jal tubi te. The crop which is burnt which will not bloom even if it is soaked in water. So again, quite a powerful uh, visualization there. We're going to move on to the next Bhagat now, uh, Nam Dev, who was born around 1270, year not exactly known, into a low-caste family in the Maharashtra region. Interestingly, uh, um, and perhaps not too surprisingly because of the practices going on at the time, um, Nam, Nam Dev actually started off worshipping idols at an early age until receiving this revelation and vision from God at which point he started preaching about what this one God and his deep love for this one God, as illustrated by this quite beautiful Shabbat below. Marvad jaise neer balaha, bel balaha karhala. As water is very precious in the desert and the creeper weeds are dear to the camel. Jyo kurank nis nad balaha to mere man ramaya. And the tune of the hunter's bell at night is enticing to the deer, so is the Lord to my mind. Tera naam rudo, roop rudo, at rang rudo, mero ramaya. Your name is so beautiful, your form is so beautiful, your love is so very beautiful, O oh my Lord. And there's actually a, a, an interesting story illustrated on this page, which actually is written in uh, Siddhi Guru Granth Sahib Ji, um, which speaks of a time when Namdev was praying in the temple, and being of a lower caste, he was thrown, thrown out, thrown to the back of the temple by the Brahmins. Quite upset by this, um, he started to then sort of meditate and focusing his mind on God. And God was quite moved by this love and devotion. And the, le and the story says that the temple was moved by God uh, and completely turned around so it was facing Namdev again and like I said I've not got the quote here today but that is in the Siddhi Guru Granth Sahib Ji. Bhagat Ramanand was born around uh, the 1360s uh, in a different region and he again used the language of the people highlighting that sort of access to everyone again about one God and interestingly there's only one hymn that features in the Guru Granth Sahib Ji. Now obviously each of the Bhagas had their own views. A lot of them were for, from actually the, the, the lower caste and um, for that reason felt a little bit disconnected um, from society and not overly happy with the way things were with the caste system. That links in nicely to what we've heard from, our presenter, from the presenters before me. Punjab being uh, invaded and reinvaded that many times over a period of just a few hundred years really, <coughs> completely battered from all sides. And, but because of this caste system, you know, the majority being of the lower caste, if you were considered an, un an untouchable, how much allegiance would you have to that country? I mean, would you, anyone coming in, you know, you wouldn't really be particularly wanting to fight them or be overly fussed. And for this reason, you know, they, when Islam came in, they, they readily converted. It was under this Hindu system that they didn't feel, this, uh, they, the older Brahminical ways, they didn't feel 
connected. They didn't feel like they were getting much. Um, and equally, the, the Buggins felt like that also. But and the point I, I think I want to make is just one hymn for Ramanand, obviously 134 for Fareed. <coughs> Guru Nanak Dev Ji, on his travels and you know, his, his uh, encounters with the Bhagavads, obviously took just the teachings and the sayings which are relevant to Sikhi, um, and those are the ones that have been used in Siddhi Guru Granth Sahib Ji. Um, but this one features in Rag Basant. Uh, Son of Dej, could you read this for me too? Jin Sakal Bikal Brahma Kate Mor. You have cut through all my confusion and doubt. Ramanand Swami Ramat Brahma. Ramanand's Lord and Master is the all-pervading Lord God. And now we come to Bhagat Kabir, who was born again around the 1390s, not known into a Muslim family, though some scholars do dispute this. Um, and I've referred uh, to the uh, North movement being called the radical Bhagati movement. I think this is quite nicely embodied by Kabir, as he was a particularly rag- radical Bhagat. Um, again, idea of one God as opposed to multiple reincarnations. And he certainly expressed his views against the Brahminical traditions very strongly and was not afraid uh, to make his feelings known. Completely anti um, the priest and the caste systems, again made this very known. Um, and he did a lot, and uh, he actually did a lot for people to sort of listen to, you know, to these views and you know, spreading the message that you know, these things are wrong. But interestingly, again, um, in line with several of the other buggers promoted this withdrawal from the world with little interest in social affairs and this is actually probably why Kabir never really took any initiative to start a major social movement, a religious movement um, and perhaps missed a trick there um, but there you go um, and here's one of the, the verses of Kabir that, that features in the Guru Granth Sahib Ji again Acharaj ek suno re pandeya ab kich kin kohon na jai, kahen na jai Listen, O religious scholar, the one Lord alone is wondrous, no one can describe him. He fascinates the angels, the celestial singers and the heavenly musicians. He has strung the three worlds upon his thread. At this point, I'm actually, apologies, I'm just going to take you back a couple of slides to Ramanand again, because one important thing I failed to mention um, was that despite only one hymn being in the Guru Granth Sahib Ji, he was actually influenced a number of Bhagats, a number of people from all different uh, uh, castes. So um, amongst those was uh, Bhagat Kabir, who was a weaver, uh, Bhagat Dunna, a farmer, Se- Bhagat Sen, a barber, and Bhagat uh, Bipa, who was a king, diverse across the board. And amongst his followers also was uh, a, a woman apostle. So that's just a point I wanted to make um, before coming back to uh, Bhagat Kabir. Now, um, this is it's titled Summary, this slide. I think something to stress is the Bhagats obviously uh, had started to recognise that, you know, the, the caste system, are these old practices really the right way of doing things? And they certainly had a, an impact. But there, were, there hadn't yet been a real total transformation. Yes, they'd started challenging these practices, but it wasn't enough to stop by any means discrimination, caste differences, the atrocities by the moguls entirely. Um, the job had not yet been done. And it's for that reason that higher intervention was required. And this is why Guru Nanak Dev Ji was ultimately sent. Uh, in a moment, God is going to nicely summarise, again it's been an awful lot of information to take in, but really stress why it was so important that Guru Nanak Dev Ji came in, but like I said, these problems had not been stopped by any means. And it's been said that Sikhi is an extension of Bhagdi, simply not the case, um, as you'll see from the next slide. Distinct differences there are, um, obviously we, we talked about the Bhagads, Almost encouraging, leaving, you know, leading a life of uh, detachment, no real interest in worldly affairs. You compare that to the Sikhi and Guru Nanak Dev Ji, emphasis on a good work ethic, Girdh Gamai, a life of uh, a family householder, which is, according to some Bhagdi and uh, quite a few Bhagdi and Sufi saints, is Maya. Um, again, another difference, renunciation of the world as a spiritual pursuit, completely rejected by Sikhi. This idea that celibacy was a prerequisite for salvation. Um, unless you really want to destroy the human race and bring that to an end, it's probably not the, uh, 
not the cleverest ideology, but again, we don't believe we full participation in life in the spirit of detachment prescribed instead. And you know, okay, so when I say um, detachment, that's obviously not detaching oneself from the world, just not being so connected um, so strongly with other people and other things that, uh, you know, um, that issues arise um, after, um, after family members pass away, etc., etc. Um, but essentially, I, I very much hope you've enjoyed this part of the presentation as much as I enjoyed researching it. I didn't know one thing about Bugsy before um, I started working on this project. Um, and I hope I've sort of offered quite a nice summary. But um, let me pass you to Gunnarvi now, who's going to bring everything to a close um, and set the, truly set the scene, um, hopefully, for our, our next presentation. Guru Nanak Dev Ji. Wahi Guru Ji Ka Khalsa. Wahi Guru Ji Ki Fateh. Okay, so Wahi Guru Ji Ka Khalsa. Wahi Guru Ji Ki Fateh. Hello again. Um, right, so I've got a little map kind of that it's going to be charting what our presentation is about. And um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to kind of start from the start, from Jeevan's presentation, work my way through, just Raj's and myself, to the end, kind of tell you a little bit about the arrival of Guru Nanak Dev Ji and uh, what that kind of means for Sikhi and the rest of India as well. So this, uh, the picture up here is uh, the invasion of India by Alexander the Great in 326 BC. It was the first real invasion, if you don't count the Aryans a couple of thousand years ago. But uh, yeah, we're not going to count that for today. So we're going to go with Alexander the Great. That was the first real invasion through the Khyber Pass, which is in Punjab. And uh, just note that that was pretty, pretty uh, that, that's quite important. We move on then to the man called Ashoka, who's the kind of statue stone head that you can see up here. People, for me, and we found throughout the presentation, don't really give Buddhism enough time in the history of India. It was very, very um, crucial to the development of India and also for itself as a way of life. You know, it's not called the light of Asia for nothing. It, it, it's it's, it's um, the way it comes across and, and its ideals are actually, they're, they're very, very good. And Ashoka, although first kind of um, developing his empire and himself very violently and forcefully, he did actually end up coming over and, and, and reforming and becoming forgiven and coming across very peacefully. And he managed to do that through Buddhism and spread Buddhism, as you saw with Jivan's map, as far east as Japan, which is it's quite, quite far, if you think of it on a world scale. But um, yeah, so then I, myself, I introduced you to the Islamic expansion that we saw, although at first, 70 to 100 years after Muhammad's death, it was quite, uh, it was quite peaceful. They did, uh, they did get quite violent after a while, and you can see the areas of expansion. They did go as far west as Spain as well at some point. So the kind of the dark orangey parts on the map. That there is the first mosque that I mentioned that was uh, built in Kerala. And then, of course, as I spoke before, this developed into what we now know today in the kind of 12th century as the Delhi Sultanate. So, yeah, I mean, as I said before, the wars that the wars and various empires that had been built up and then fell again and then other empires built up, you know, that was all out of the fact that India was so easy to invade because, because of this caste system. You know, the fabric of Indian society was weak. It, the people in India, they felt that they had no self-worth. I mean, you know, as just Raj mentioned, if you're, a, if you're an untouchable or if you're an un, unskilled worker, at, at these two bottom tiers on this, uh, on this nice triangle here, if you're, if you're those two bottom tiers, why would you want to protect people which look down on you and don't even speak to you? It, 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 just, it, it just doesn't work. And um, that, for me, is why India was so easy to invade and such a broken society. And, you know, this was where Bhakti, Bhag, the Bhakti movement came in. You know, it refers to an adoration of a single one God. 
and you know, spanned from the 6th to the 15th centuries. But although it attempted to break, break off the shackles held by this caste system, it couldn't really succeed because at the end of the day, if you don't have a legacy from each Bhagat, like you did with Sikhi, with the Gurus, each had their own legacy. You look at Guru Nanak, philosopher, quite a, you know, quite a powerful philosopher with ideals, Guru, all the way over to Guru Gobind Singh Ji, saint, soldier, fighter, defending his faith. You know, they all had their own different legacies. You guys probably didn't know much about the Bhakti movement, forgive me if I'm wrong, but because they did not leave a legacy, and that was a fundamental problem. And it was really Guru Nanak Dev Ji there. I, I, I really like that picture because most of the pictures I've seen in my childhood, and I, I, you guys may have seen as well, you know, Guru Nanak Dev Ji sitting there very peacefully, very with in, in, tranqu in, in tranquility, kind of just meditating. And he seemed to me, you know, when I was a child, as everyone likes the fighter, the hero, you know, Guru Gobind Singh Ji, but no one really paid enough attention to Guru Nanak Dev Ji. And I think that one there, that picture there shows him walking, you know, striding. You know, this man made as many, it made, made some crazy excursions. He went as far kind of in, in, to Europe from India. He walked from Europe to India, uh, from India to Europe, which is just crazy. And I didn't learn that until I did this presentation. And for me, someone like that who actively sets out rules, you know, he's strongly against the caste system, and he does something to make that happen. He leaves a legacy. You know, he builds what was a fragmented, fragmented society, which was divided socially, had internal anarchy. Civil war was raging everywhere. He built that up through Sikhi, given the opportunity to teach people about Sikhi. And I think that's what's so powerful about Guru Nanak Dev Ji. And I think that's just what we really need to remember. But as I said, that will be covered in depth in the next presentation so uh, I hope you guys enjoyed today and uh, come back next time for a little bit more thank you Vai Guji Ka Khalsa Kole Sonia Sonia what a team I think they have raised the bar every time they do a presentation Guru Granth is reformation that was that all that was wrong and you want to start with the Mool Mantar try to understand what the backdrop was. So that's where the journey begins now for all of us. It does. And we'll be moving ahead. Let me uh, give a big thank you to Sridha Guru Preet Singh, who is actually about to leave, uh, excuse himself, to leave for his award. Uh, forgive us if you all didn't have time to meet him, but... He is going to be back hopefully next week here on, on uh, Sunday. So you will have that opportunity. Um, I will actually now hand you over to Navtej Jessel. As usual, he will have the Q&A session. So you'll have the opportunity to raise some questions. And I do um, apologize to Paisabji there that the lights are on. We are not accustomed to this. We have never been under the cameras of televisions before. We don't know how to walk this journey, but next time we'll make sure that it's not so disturbing. The lights will be somewhere else. So, okay, you Waigurji ka khalsa, Waigurji ki fateh. Waigurji ka khalsa, Waigurji ki fateh. I think uh, everybody will agree it was a fantastic presentation. And thank you to all three presenters. Um, and so, you know, keep it up. And I think hopefully it'll be an inspiration to the youth. And that's what we're hoping to project to the outside world. So I'm happy at this stage to start taking questions um, from the audience. So, yeah, so if we could have questions from the audience, please, anyone. Hanji. May I ask one question? Is there, is there enough, is there, is there enough evidence to uh, is that the Mongols were Muslims? Uh, Mongol traditionally, we think they were tribal people, they were pagans, and their desire to expansion was, of course, motivated for something. They may have got onto the uh, horseback becoming uh, Muslims, but uh, I'm not absolutely certain that there is sufficient evidence to 
think that the Mongol, to begin with, when they started, they had any inclination towards uh, uh, being uh, Muslims. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that question. Karambi, do we have any, any research on this? Um, to, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Uh, well, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I think there was a slight slip of the tongue uh, during the presentation, but uh, Mongols were in fact nomadic tribes from Mongolia, and later on, probably um, sort of uh, well into their expansion, that uh, as, as they um, uh, went towards east, they, they did adopt Islam. Yeah. So we apologise for that. Yeah. Haji. Inspector, brother and sisters, our subject is the word before Shri Guru Nanak Dev Ji. We are talking later on the uh, history of the Guru Nanak Dev later on. But uh, I want to say something. There was a simple word. Everybody was um, have a, uh, wearing bread, beards and over clean shape in that time. We were drinking uh, conal waters and uh, river waters and also pond waters and they are getting medicine from jadu tuna not any others and i i, I want to let you know the art guru nanak meant all these things nam da jap and stress on any things hey, he had sincere love all the communities example is bala mardana you know before guru nanak the subject is, what was the way of living before Guru Nanak? The way of living very dangerous. When a young man die, the young woman, his wife I mean, have to burn with the graves. You understand? Moreover, he compared Sati the Rasam. Later on, abolish forever. Moreover, the second question is, nobody is, we are telling, the other history, I know, you know, Aurangzeb, Savaman, Janyu, Lona, that is another thing. Main, uh, you get more time and more accuracy later on. The subject is word before Guru Nanak. The main, I told you, he amended all the Muslim uh, unity with the, their own teaching, you know. Makkah Feria, Babi Makkah Feria, Jari Dala, Wala Khai, Othe Jaake, Kitab, Kaudar Ashik, other examples. I want to let you know the main subject in the Adasis, four Adasis, he had all, you have seen the different examples and meant the words. I beg pardon, I am not rich in English, my pronunciation is not so good, and beg pardon on my part, and the subject is what before Gunan, very simple, very superstition, very critical condition. He served a very good um, service for the humanity and secrecy. Onane, the, may, he may also made the character, Dev Parayya Charangiya, Mama Penatiya Jane. Before Guru Nan, there were so many marriage, one person marriage, one, two, three, four. Therefore, you watch all this. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Pai Sabji, for your, your very interesting comments. And as we have said, this is setting the scene for the world before Guru Nanak. And as, we, as our presenters have said, the next presentation, which will be talking about Guru Nanak Dev Ji, his message, he was a reformer. Why We have set the scene for what was the world like. Why did God feel it necessary to send Guru Nanak Dev Ji? And so that will be the subject of a future presentation. So, any further questions? Gurmeet Sabji. First of all, uh, uh, not a question, but uh, big thanks to the team uh, for their wonderful presentation. Uh, I think uh, it was uh, for very much intellectuals and uh, for those who, who want to learn something. And I'm sure your effort won't go wasted and uh, every will, everybody will learn from it. And uh, uh, with this, keep it up, never give up. There will be some criticism, but uh, uh, as as both three of you have like spent a lot of your time and a lot of effort is put in into this, so I'm sure uh, uh, we'll build up on this and uh, uh, don't get disheartened even if you have one or two negative comments. But it's one of those who understand, uh, the one, one of those who want to learn. So with this.
Thank you very much indeed from all of us. Thank you. Why Guruji ka khas sabd? Yeah, why Guruji ka khas sabd? Guruji Banji. Oh, you want me to stand up? Okay. Uh, well, again, what we Gurmeet Singh said, I I echo that. Uh, it was a very vast expense of time, historical time, in order to cover uh, quite a few things happening in the world at the same time, more or less. Uh, so, by its very nature, this complexity cannot be put into, uh, you know, in such a small uh, period of time, which we have just covered 45 minutes. Uh, my sort of comment question is more in relation to the bhaktas. Uh, I know it's it's a bit difficult really to uh, pick up the complexity therein as well. And I feel that if some of the messages of the bhagats were not in tune with Guru Granth Sahib, they wouldn't have been there in Guru Granth Sahib. So we need to actually make sure that we do not present them in such a way that it conflicts with our own understanding of Sri Guru and Sahib Ji. Sat Sri yeah, Nate, Thank you. Your comments will be taken on board. And as you said, to try and research all this within 45, 50 minutes. And I think what we will do, the, the Bani of the Pagats is, is something that will be the subject of a future presentation. So that will be very carefully thought in, and presented. Hanji. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to accept what the last speaker has said. This was what was coming in my mind all the time, that what the Pagat said, that's exactly the philosophy of Guru Nanak Dev Ji. Pagat said, Toi moi moi toi antar kaisa. Pagat said, this is a simple stone on the ground. You pick it up, you carve it, and then you start calling it God. How can it be true? And Guru Gobind Singh Ji finally said, Manas ke jaat sabhe ek ki pechan. The Pagats were married. They were ordinary people, coming from ordinary family. They were not Rajas or Brahmins. I think the whole thing is what Guru Nanak Dev Ji took forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, if that's it, thank you very much for your time. The, oh, sorry, go ahead. So, okay, uh, perhaps as the last comment, it could suit as well. One of the speakers mentioned about Buddhism being coming out as the light of Asia. And now I'm very pleased indeed that our young people, they have taken it on board that Sikhism this is going to be light of the world, not just Asia only. Thank you very much for taking it forward. So nice, thank you.